Uh, pleased to, uh, to introduce uh, David Kern, Chief Executive Officer, uh, Chairman, Co-Founder of 4D Molecular Therapeutics. Thanks, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. As uh, Josh said, I'm Dave Kern. I'm the CEO and co-founder of 4D, and we're a targeted next-generation AV uh, gene therapy company. So uh, by way of background, our value proposition is uh, we have a transformative discovery program for novel vectors called Therapeutic Vector Evolution. This evolved out of uh, David Schaefer's work at UC Berkeley with directed evolution of uh, AAV capsids. Uh, and this allows us to create optimized and highly uh, proprietary AAV vectors that can target any tissue or cell type in the body of interest for the treatment of genetic diseases with high unmet medical need. So the overview of the company, we were founded in 2014. Again, Dave Schaefer is really a pioneer in uh, AV uh, vector biology, and I'm a clinician scientist who spent the better part of 20 years uh, designing and uh, developing uh, therapeutic viruses for gene therapy purposes, so it was a, a very nice synergistic uh, combination. Um, as I said, the uh, platform therapeutic vector evolution allows us to create customized best-in-class AV vectors and products, and we believe this allows us to overcome uh, some of the hurdles with the first-generation AV vectors. As you know, there's been tremendous progress with the first-generation vectors, but there's really been uh, problems with proper uh, targeting, highly efficient of targeting and selectivity of targeting of the vectors. Um, also, the routes of administration have oftentimes been almost quasi-surgical to brute force enough delivery to the target tissues of interest, and we really want to allow the field to use the optimal clinical route of administration to target the tissues of interest. Uh, and then finally, antibody, uh, the presence of neutralizing antibodies in the population is a problem for a number of the serotypes currently used, and we can build in antibody resistance into our vectors to avoid that problem and increase the number of patients that we can treat. Um, from a patent standpoint, because these are, this is all novel biology, these are vectors that have never been uh, seen before, uh, these are highly proprietary compositions of matter and uh, easily patentable. Um, we're working in a number of therapeutic areas and we need good partners. Uh, we can't be experts in all therapeutic areas, so we do have uh, five partnerships to date. We have a partnership with Pfizer in the cardiovascular space. We have a partnership with Roche in the retina for several rare retinal diseases. We also have partnerships with AGTC in the retina, with Unicure in the liver and CNS, and with Benetech in the retina. Uh, in addition, like all the other uh, rare disease companies here, we value our relationships with patient advocacy groups, and we do have uh, funding and support from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for a, a pre-ID candidate there and uh, support from the Foundation Finding Blindness and Croideremia Research Foundation. So our pipeline will be diversified both uh, 4D internal programs that we'll take forward to the clinic uh, as well as partner products. Our indications will focus primarily on uh, finding ways to validate these vectors as quickly and efficiently as possible in the clinic. So we'll be looking at monogenic recessive diseases with high unmet medical needs and very clear early term uh, clinical readouts, uh, whereas I think large market complex disorders will, will likely be uh, partnering those with large pharma. Our lead IND candidate is a, a retinal uh, blinding disorder called choroideremia, uh, and this is a monogenic recessive uh, disorder, and we expect to file the IND for that in the first half of next year. Our lead investor is Pfizer R&D, uh, and uh, we are based in Emeryville, just down the road from UC Berkeley. So as I said, this is a broad platform. We're currently operating in over 10 different areas. Here's a partial list. In seven of those therapeutic areas, we've already identified lead vector candidates. Uh, when we talk about lead vectors that come out of our screens, typically we'll discover a handful of uh, common families or motifs that uh, solve the problem of delivery to the tissue that we're interested in. So we do have a number of lead vector families in the retina using intravitreal administration rather than the subretinal uh, approach that the for, uh, field's been forced to use to date with the current wild type vectors. We also have CNS vectors we've discovered with our partners at Unicure with intrathecal administration. We have a lung targeting vector that's uh, delivered by aerosolized delivery. Uh, and then liver, heart, 
skeletal muscle and joint, uh, these are all IV programs. All of our discovery is performed in vivo in non-human primates. Uh, we don't do anything in monkey, dog, or other species because, again, this evolution that we're doing is uh, very species-specific and it's critical to use uh, these vectors in, in, in the primate in vivo and then in primary human organotypic models uh, ex vivo. So I'll just show you just a little bit of data. Uh, this will be the only data slide just showing what we can achieve with this sort of approach. This is in-life data from monkeys uh, following an intravitreal injection of a 4D vector expressing GFP. And over time, we can actually, in life, get images of the retina and look at GFP expression over time. On the left is the expected uh, result with an AB2 control. This is uh, very early on. This is just two weeks after infusion. And on the right-hand side, you can see extremely diffuse, widespread, uh, and intense expression of GFP uh, throughout the retina, uh, both in the periphery and also importantly, we get very nice uh, targeting of the central fovea where the high acuity color vision is and uh, which is something that's not possible to directly target with a subretinal injection. So with that, I will stop and uh, take some questions from my friend Josh. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I guess it's always interesting to, to see a company with, with a novel um, hammer, you know, a novel platform and, and figuring out, well, what nails do you hit first? So, so what was it that led you into the, specifically choroideremia as a lead program. There are other companies in, in front of you. Um, maybe just kind of take us through the thinking and then how you expect that dynamic to evolve over time. Sure, so that's a great question. So I think you know, we wanted to start with the retina for several reasons. First of all, the, uh, we have a beautiful, uh, highly proprietary vector in hand that's been uh, validated in two different non-human primate uh, models. There's a huge, a number of unmet medical diseases in the retina. The target volume is relatively small, so from a manufacturing standpoint, it puts a minimal stress on the system with our first product. Uh, and then uh, very clear uh, measurable clinical endpoints, including OCT measurements, which are highly reproducible anatomical measurements that the FDA has signaled could be uh, used for approval. Uh, in terms of choroideremia as a specific target, we like it for a couple of reasons. First, the, the gene small, it fits into uh, the vector, it's a monogenic recessive disease, so if you replace that, you should see clinical benefit. And we do feel that it's, um, while there's been good safety and some proof of concept in the retina with other diseases, choroideremia is one that starts in the periphery and has this uh, incessant march towards the center, and eventually the last thing patients lose is that high acuity vision. So we do feel that a subretinal injection with just a localized expression in 5 to 10 percent of the retina is pretty unlikely to cure these patients, and I think we can uh, do them a great service with the intravitreal injection. And I'd say finally, at the, at the end, is um, the Choroideremia Research Foundation approached us really in search of intravitreal approaches, and uh, they've been great supporters of ours. I guess another advantage of the eye is relatively immunoprivileged. Um, as, you, as you move outside of the eye, uh, with some modifications to AAV, how do you evaluate for immunogenicity profile um, in, in preclinical setting to get comfortable to move into the clinic? Yeah, I think there we would uh, evaluate the immunogenicity in non-human primates. We do not expect ours to be any less immunogenic than your standard AAVs. What we can do is uh, design them to evade pre-existing antibodies in the population, and then we can uh, engineer next generation vectors for companies that want to repeat dose, for example. We can uh, evolve the vectors to be resistant to uh, high titer antibodies from the first vector. So in other words, if somebody was using AB2 or AB9 uh, but wanted to come in later and redose, we could essentially evolve capsids that are highly resistant to those pre-existing antibodies. And how do you think about testing and evolving that model? Because that creates a very interesting dynamic of almost sequential repeat therapy, you know, right. which is one thing that's, that's not been amenable, av available as a strategy to AV to date, but, but the ability to evolve quickly um, gives you some unique, unique opportunity. Maybe we can talk about how you see that unfolding. Yeah, I think um, you know, the beauty of this platform is we can basically evolve for several different features simultaneously. So while we can be targeting, for example, the retina or skeletal muscle, uh, we can 
also add in exposure to pools of human IV immunoglobulin or uh, serum from patients who've been treated and uh, with another vector and have high titer antibodies to that vector. And so we can get vectors that both target tissue of interest and have that antibody resistance. So I think it opens up a, a great opportunity for us and also for with our partners to, to come in with uh, subsequent therapies, either because the initial treatment is wearing off or because there was suboptimal uh, delivery and expression from the first dose. Let's see if there are any questions in the audience. Yeah, in the back. Hey, how are you? Uh, quick question about, can, do you think you can evolve um, the issues for uh, manufacturing, the rate limiting steps in the manufacturing of AAV, do you think you can evolve a system that would actually make a much better production scenario? Well, I do think that, um, yes, I think it's possible. So, so one of the things that I didn't mention is that as we do the evolution, it's a, a number of sequential steps, and it usually takes on the order of 9 to 15 months. Um, in between each of those steps in the non-human primate, we actually have to repackage the pool. So we're simultaneously evolving for good delivery in vivo and also for efficient packaging. So at least to date, uh, the vectors that we've looked at have been uh, efficient packagers on uh, either equivalent or superior to the existing uh, vectors. So I think the answer to your question is absolutely yes. If you had a packaging cell line that you're particularly interested in, then just building packaging in that line in with the discovery program would absolutely accomplish that goal. Because I guess it's so important for, for understanding, maybe you could just take us through the process by which you, you generate a diverse library and select vectors. Sure, so evolution, as you know, has two components. One is genetic diversity, and the other is natural selection to, to really ferret out the, the uh, biology that you want. So the first order of business is to take the wild-type existing capsid genomes and apply molecular biology techniques to create massive diversity. So. Uh, our team under Dave Schaefer's leadership has generated 25 different individual capsid libraries with different starting materials and then different techniques to generate uh, diversity. And this could be anything from serotype shuffling to random mutagenesis to saturation mutagenesis. We have some ancestral uh, libraries and we also have random seven or point mutation libraries at strategic points in the capsid. So 25 libraries generating on the order of 100 million uh, potential variants in that library. So we have massive diversity. Uh, and then we just put it, that pool through a series of steps uh, and really just funneled that library down based on given vectors' ability to achieve what we want them to achieve in vivo. So if we want to go intravitreal to the RPE cells at the back of the, of the retina, we put the pool into the vitreous, we wait a couple of weeks, we harvest the eye, we harvest those RPE cells, we take them to the lab, we break it open, get the genomes, the small percentage, less than 1% that get there, uh, grow those up in our producer cells, and then repeat that on the order of six times, increasing the stringency each time, and in some cases building in exposure to pre-existing antibodies in the, in the population. And at the end of that, we get down to a handful of, of genomes that will have common motifs that allow the vector to deliver the target of interest. In the case of the retina, these uh, changes allow the, the vector to get through the ILM barrier and then get enhanced uptake uh, in the target cells at the back of the eye. And what is it that you're, you're looking for? Um, is it number of uh, cell vectors per cell, or is it um, number of cells transfected, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, so in the discovery, we're really just asking what vectors get to the target tissue and get to the uh, nucleus. Um, in the case of um, actually characterizing the vectors, we do that with uh, either intracellular or secreted marker genes, and we do that in both non-human primates and also in primary human organotypic models to make sure that whatever we discover in the primates actually will translate to humans. So I think uh, depending on the target of interest, you may want high expression from a few cells in a secreted situation. Another uh, uh, disease indications you may, may want to hit as many cells as possible. And I think our evolution allows us to do both. Any, uh, any other last minute questions? And if not, uh, I think we're at the end of our time. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.